Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to discuss the commonly tested pediatric musculoskeletal diseases. Let's first dive in and start with developmental dysplasia of the hip. Now with this condition, the pathology can be located in the acetabulum and or the proximal femur. This results in an instability in the hip. Now risk factors for developing this include a breech presentation at 34 weeks or older, female gender, swaddling infants, so when you swaddle them excessively, that can cause that, and or having a family history of the condition. Now, there's several ways that this can present and be identified, and it is crucial the hip mobility is assessed at every well-child visit until the patient is walking. Now, several maneuvers can be performed to assess for hip mobility before the age of three months, including the uh, Ortolani maneuver. Now, this maneuver involves the physician or yourself placing their hands over the child's knee and putting a gentle upward stress on the lateral thigh and greater trochanter area while slowly abducting the legs. If a dislocated and reducible hip is present, then you'll feel a, uh, a clunk. There'll be a palpable clunk. That leads to a positive test. Now, the next maneuver, also performed in infants under three months of age, is the Barlow maneuver. This involves the physician, or you, moving the hips into mild adduction and applying a slight forward pressure. When the Barlow maneuver is performed, if a subluxed or dislocated hip is present, a palpable clunk is felt. That leads to a positive test. The Galeazzi test is another one we can use in patients both under and older than three months of age. Now, at this point, the Ortolani and the Barlow maneuvers are no longer useful because the unstable hips will have stabilized in either the pathological reduced position or a dislocated position. So the Galeazzi test is performed by placing the infant in a supine position, flexing the hips at 45 degrees, and having the knees flexed at 90 degrees with both feet flat on the exam table. And if there is an unequal height of the knees, the Galeazzi sign is positive. This means either one of the hips is dislocated or there is congenital femoral shortening. Now, this test is not useful if the pathology is bilateral, which is in more than a third of cases. Now, in children who can walk, a positive Trendelenburg pelvic tilt test can be used. Now, you probably know this test as it relates to uh, injections in the gluteal region. But um, in this test, when we have a patient standing on one leg on the affected side, the pelvis tilts downward towards the unaffected side. That would be the side without hip pathology. So in children older than three months, limited hip abduction to less than 45 degrees would also be consistent with developmental dysplasia of the hip. Now, imaging that we can use to identify this condition includes an ultrasound of the hip up until the patient is six months of age. Now, this can confirm the presence of an abnormal hip joint. After six months, hip radiographs are going to be used to help us identify hip positioning. Now, the diagnosis is made based on clinical abnormalities, which can then be confirmed with diagnostic imaging using, using either an ultrasound or x-ray, depending on the patient's age. Now, without an appropriate diagnosis and treatment, patients with developmental dysplasia of the hip are at increased risk of lifelong pain, poor hip mobility, as well as early osteoarthritis. Now, treatment is going to focus on making sure that there's consistent concentric reduction of the hip so that the femoral head and acetabulum develop appropriately to avoid these pathologies. An abduction splint is used for patients under six months of age, and this is associated with excellent outcomes. The vast majority of patients in this scenario would obtain and maintain hip reduction with this early intervention. Now, if this isn't identified until after six months of age, then either closed or open reduction under anesthesia would be needed. In either case, follow-up radiographs are obtained to ensure proper development of the hip joint. Next up, we've got leg calve perthes disease. This is a syndrome causing idiopathic osteonecrosis of the hip, also, of course, known as avascular necrosis of the hip. Now, in this condition, boys are affected more frequently than girls, and the age of onset is between 3 and 12 years of age. So here the patient will present with insidious hip pain and a limp that is made worse with activity and that may not be relieved with rest or medications. Now, this is a difficult diagnosis to make because early hip x-rays are often normal, and only in later stages of the disease will there be fragmentation and healing of the femoral head causing deformity. For this reason, MRI with contrast can be employed to visualize whether the proximal femoral epiphyseal vascularity is intact before x-ray changes are seen, and this can help us make a diagnosis when the index of suspicion is high. Now, treatment of this condition involves containing the femoral head within the acetabulum with either splinting or, if we're dealing with a severe case, 
surgery. Next up, we have slip capital femoral epiphysis. This condition is characterized by anterior lateral and superior displacement of the proximal femur distal to the growth plate. Now, the risk factors for developing this condition include obesity, growth spurts, as well as endocrine abnormalities like growth hormone deficiency or hypothyroidism. Now, the typical age of onset for this condition is between 8 and 15 years of age, but most patients are between 12 and 13 when it shows up. Now, this patient presents with limping and vague pain in the hip, groin, thigh, or knee. Now, this pain can be isolated, for example, just in the knee, even though it's hip pathology. So that's a really important detail to keep in mind. Now, the condition can be unilateral, it could be bilateral, and the pain is sometimes characterized as dull or achy. Now, the pain is often made worse with walking, and it can be chronic or it can be intermittent. Imaging is diagnostic with an x-ray of the hip showing what appears to be posterior displacement of the femoral epiphysis. Now, this will not be present until later on in the disease course, in which case the x-ray would be normal. So if we have a high suspicion of uh, a high index of suspicion, we'll do an MRI that will show widening of the epiphysis uh, surrounded by edema. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we'll make our diagnosis based on clinical symptoms and imaging like I said, with either radiography or MRI, which would be consistent with the diagnosis. Patients should then avoid any weight bearing until surgery has occurred because we want to prevent worsening of the displacement and further damage. Now, the surgery performed for this condition is operative stabilization with placement of a single cannulated screw in the middle of the epiphysis to prevent displacement. Without prompt surgery, patients are at risk of osteonecrosis of the femoral head, of a rapidly progressive loss of articular cartilage, and femoroacetabular impingement, all of which lead to an increased risk of osteoarthritis. Next up, we've got scoliosis. This is, of course, a lateral curvature of the spine greater than 10 degrees. Now, this is much more common in females versus males. It may be noticeable that the arms are hanging to the patient's side at different lengths. That's due to the spine's curvature to one side. The patient may also have asymmetry of the shoulders, the scapula, and or the waist. Now, tests commonly employed to identify scoliosis are the Adams forward bend test, where you basically have the patient, um, you observe the patient from behind and you have the patient place their feet together, have their knees facing forward, and you have them bend forward at the waist until the spine is parallel to the horizontal plane. Any rib prominences that are visible on one side and not the other would be a positive test. You want to then assess patients using a non-invasive scoliometer, which is basically a version of a carpenter's level that's been adapted for use in measuring the rotational prominence of scoliosis. So this device would be placed on the forward bending patient, the same patient, uh, the same position that would, we would use to, uh, to do the Adams test. And then we take the scoliometer and place it along the patient's spine from cephalad to caudad. And the small bubble or the ball in the device will deviate from the center of the device. That basically will give us an idea of what we're dealing with. Now, radiographic imaging is used to both assess the degree uh, and the direction of the curvature uh, measured by the Cobb angle, and also to assess the amount of growth remaining in the patient, as those with greater growth remaining have a higher risk of curve progression. The skeletal maturity can be evaluated using the Risser sign, which evaluates the iliac apophysis to see how advanced ossification and fusion is. The less ossification and fusion present, the more growth that still needs to occur, and the higher likelihood of worsening scoliosis. Now, the Cobb angle is measured by drawing a line parallel to the top of the end plate of the most cephalad vertebrae involved in a curve, and another line drawn, um, drawn parallel to the bottom of the end plate of the most caudad vertebrae on that curve. The Cobb angle is formed by the intersection of these two lines, and a Cobb angle of over 10 degrees is diagnostic. Now, if patients have either a progression of scoliosis as indicated by a Cobb angle increase by 10 degrees or more in a year, or any pain or any neuroscience, then an MRI needs to be performed. Now, when it comes to management, if your Cobb angle is between 11 and 29 degrees, close observation with clinical assessments every 5 to 9 months should be done, and that depends on whether the patient's closer to 11 or 29 degrees. If it's 11, we will do it uh, less frequently. If it's worse, we will do it more frequently. Now, if the patient has a Cobb angle between 30 and 39 degrees, bracing would be used as long as the patient still has growth remaining as determined by the Risser grade. Now, if the patient's no longer growing, the brace won't be effective. Patients with Cobb angles between 40 and 49 degrees may have bracing or require surgical, surgical correction of their spine. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first one. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. I'm sure you'll need more time. So hit that pause button, figure it out, and then come on back. 
correct answer here is D. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is C. And your final question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, guys, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you on the next one. Bye.